uh, is going to be a very interesting start to our day. And uh, to segue into this, I'm going to invite uh, NAAA President Jerry Hinton to the stage to introduce our, uh, our gentleman this morning. If you would, please welcome Jerry Hinton this morning, the National Remarketing Conference at the NAAA. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation of the Auction of Tomorrow, Planning for Changing Times. Now, being an NAAA president uh, requires, uh, there's a lot of pressure on an NAAA president. Tony Long just asked me a second ago, do you have everything covered? Do you have everything covered? And I said, boy, I, I got 10, 10, uh, 10 hours left to cover the Middle East, tax reform, and uh, taking care of the homeless problems. So I thought, uh, hopefully, we'll try to get to that before about 8 o'clock tonight. Um, I think all of us would love to have a crystal ball and to know what's going to happen in the future. Um, I think that is more, more important today than probably any time uh, in the past because we, we are all very interested about uh, changing times, the, the uh, paradigm shifts that are happening in, uh, on the internet, uh, uh, electronically, digitally. Uh, there are a lot of uh, shifts that are happening across the world. Um, well, what, what would happen if we, uh, we had a crystal ball, if we could look forward and we could uh, maybe have a glimpse of understanding of what's going to happen? Um, I think we might be able to uh, engage in our businesses in terms of better capital improvements, leasehold improvements, those kinds of things, and uh, maybe navigate ourselves in a direction that would be a little more positive for uh, all of our uh, businesses and employees and families. So... It is my pleasure today uh, to introduce uh, two gentlemen that, I'm, uh, that didn't uh, arrive in a DeLorean with a flux capacitor, but they'll be uh, taking us into the future as we uh, expected uh, business forecasters that they are. Uh, the first one is Thomas Fry. He is the founder of the Da Vinci Institute in Westminster, Colorado. Uh, as the think tank's executive director and, and, and uh, senior futurist, he works with his board of visionaries to develop original studies that enable him to predict the future of a ver variety of topics. He uses a rare blend of reality-based thinking and clear-headed visualization to translate today's trends into tomorrow's opportunities. Before establishing his institute, Tom spent 15 years with IBM, earning more awards than any other engineer there. Today, his uh, foresight, coupled with his understanding uh, of their implications, captivate audiences ranging from high-level government uh, officials to executives of Fortune 500 companies, such as AT&T, Hewlett Packard, Lucent Technology, uh, First Data, Boeing, Capital One, Bell Canada, Visa, Ford Motor Company, to just to name a few. Next, Glenn Mercer. Glenn Mercer is an automotive industry analyst with more than three decades of experience, which includes over 20 years as a partner with McKinsey & Company, leading that firm's automotive practice in hundreds of client studies. In the last 10 years, he's been an independent advisor to venture capital and equity investors, some of whom are in the automotive world. Serving as a board member for several automotive firms and an uh, expert witness in auto-related legal cases and lecturer on the industry, Glenn constantly refreshes his knowledge with research projects uh, and uh, is, is a, a very knowledgeable, meticulous, and uh, methodical individual. I had an opportunity to be interviewed by him a few months ago, and he's got a great uh, sense of, of the direction of, of, uh, of everything. He recently completed an in-depth study on the future of automotive, automotive retail for NADA. So I'm, I'm very excited to have these two individuals uh, with us and I think has uh, particular um, relevance to uh, all of us here in this room. So sit back and prepare to get ahead by looking ahead at what's in store for our industry with Tom and Glenn. All right, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today. I want to start off by just mentioning that I'm an industry outsider. So I'm gonna be giving you an outsider perspective. So this is valuable in some respects, it's not valuable in some other respects, so we'll, so keep that in mind as, as I go through this. The other thing I'm gonna mention is that when I make a prediction, the true value of a prediction is that it forces you to think about some point in the future and to draw your own conclusions, because invariably I'll be wrong in some aspect of a lot of these predictions. 
But it forces you to think about that and draw your own conclusions. So there's real value in doing that. Now we're going to start off with um, the, the whole coming infrastructure inversion. There's, you know, when, when cars first came out, um, late 1800s, early 1900s, everybody said, oh good, we can get rid of horses, we can drive cars. No, nobody, nobody actually said that. Um, they said, yeah, cars, that's just for rich people and they're just toys and they're not gonna be around much longer. But cars did make their inroads and soon blacksmith shops ended up being replaced with gas stations. And the dirt roads that the cars had to drive on uh, ended up being replaced with highways. But that took many years. In the Paris World's Fair in 1989, that was the first year that electricity was on display anywhere in the world. And the mayor of Paris famously said that after the Paris World's Fair is over and after the Eiffel Tower is dismantled, we will no longer hear about electricity. So a lot of you don't realize this, but the only reason we still have electricity is because the Eiffel Tower is still standing. <laughs> Early internet had to operate on the same phone lines as the human voice. Uh, that was a problem. Um, switchboard operators were soon replaced with dial-up phones, and then the dial-up phones were, um, dial-up modems were replaced with fiber modems. But soon we're gonna have lots of changes to infrastructure. Now the cryptocurrency world, which has taken off like a rocket right now, um, has to grow up in a world dominated by the traditional banking infrastructure. By the way, how many of you actually accept Bitcoin uh, on your auctions? Um, the value of Bitcoin right now is right around 7,500 per Bitcoin as of this morning. Um, and autonomous cars are being introduced into a world that's dominated by traditional driving cars with human operators. And flying drones are having to carve out space in a world controlled by traditional aviation. Now all of this is happening um, and we're going to be seeing lots of changes in infrastructure along the way as a result of this. So what will a fully autonomous vehicle infrastructure look like? We don't even know yet. We, we have a lot of people making uh, good guesses but uh, uh, all of those will have to be modified over time. See, we end up being a very backward-looking society. We're backward-looking because it's just human nature. See, we've all personally experienced the past. As we look around us, we see evidence of the past all around us. In fact, all information we come into contact with is essentially history. So the past is very knowable, and yet we're going to be spending the rest of our lives in the future. So it's almost as if we're walking backwards into the future. My job as a futurist is to help turn people around, give them some idea of what the future might hold. So how does the future get created? Well, it gets created in the minds of everybody around us. We all participate in creating the future. But people make decisions today based on their understanding of what the future holds. So I use this phrase quite a bit, the future creates the present. Now this is just the opposite of what most people think. Most people think that what we're doing today is somehow going to create the future, but from a little different perspective, it sees images of the future that we hold in our head determine our actions today. So if we change someone's vision of the future, we change the way they make decisions today. So this is my promise to you. My promise to you is that before you leave here today, I'm gonna to change your vision of the future, and as a result, you're gonna walk out of here making different decisions. Now, if I don't do that, please hold my feet to the fire. I'll, I'll try harder. <laughs> I get asked a lot, do you have a crystal ball? Yes, I do have a crystal ball. It was just sitting around at home, and my wife says, why don't you just take this to the office? It's just collecting dust. So I, I put my crystal ball in the car. I was no more than, oh, four or five minutes down the road. I looked over and I saw that my crystal ball had actually started to fire on the seat next to me. This, this is the sun shining in, the crystal ball is a giant lens, and so this little science experiment happening on the seat next to me. 
Luckily, I was able to put the fire out and it didn't cause any serious damage. But then I had this revelation. Obviously, this revelation came from my crystal ball. And the revelation was is that the newspaper headlines the next day were going to say, futurist killed by his own crystal ball. <laughs> and he didn't see it coming. Um, so that's my disclaimer. I don't see everything. Uh, as Larry Page says, the main reasons companies fail is because they miss the future. They're getting blindsided by technology. This is happening in so many different ways right now. Now, a lot of the technology we're running into today is what I refer to as catalytic innovation. Now, catalytic innovation is different than disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is disrupting existing industries. Catalytic innovation is creating entire new industries. So examples of catalytic innovation from the past were things like electricity, automobiles, airplanes, telephones, photographs. All of these went on to create multi-billion, multi-trillion dollar industries. But here's the thing. All industries are a bell curve. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And yes, a thousand years from now, every industry we have today will have been replaced multiple times. The other key thing is that the most profitable industries today end up being in the second half of the bell curve, constantly having to do more with less. I made this prediction in 2012, and I get quoted on it in newspapers, magazines, TV stations, literally all over the world. And the prediction is that by, 2000, by 2030, over 2 billion jobs are going to disappear. Now, this was never intended to be a doom or gloom statement. It was never intended to say that we're going to have 2 billion people unemployed in the world. It was intended to say that uh, we have to wake up. We have to understand that we're going to have to create jobs at a faster rate than ever before. This is what I refer to as the level problem. This is the level problem. To hang pictures straight on the wall, we use it to do carpentry work. But once we download a level app, a lot of us no longer need that tool. That means we don't have to have as many aluminum frames. We don't have to have as many glass bulbs. We don't have to have as many people doing the assembly work, the shipping, the receiving, the retail stores that are handling it. Now, every time we download a mobile app, we're eliminating a piece of a job. It's a very, very tiny piece. But once we start downloading billions upon billions of mobile apps, we're eliminating lots of jobs. Oxford researchers a couple years ago looked at 700 different occupations, and they concluded that 47% of those jobs today are going to get taken over by machines. Coincidentally, this works out to right around 2 billion. So thank you, Oxford. That was nice. <laughs> but it's not just the low-level jobs. Companies like Uber, Airbnb, uh, Lyft, all of these sharing economy companies have figured out how to use software to eliminate middle management jobs. The key thing to understand is that we're not eliminating total jobs, we're automating tasks out of existence. A recent study showed that the only job that's been totally automated out of existence in the last 67 years has been that of the elevator operator. By one count, 100 years ago, we had 265,000 elevator operators around the United States. Now, all of those jobs went away. Now, the job that hasn't gone away is that of the elevator repairman. Now, all of this technology that we're introducing into the world needs a repair culture to follow after it. We haven't been good at developing that yet. So on one hand, we're eliminating jobs. On the other hand, we're freeing up human capital. But just because our jobs disappear doesn't mean that we've run out of work to do in the world. I mean, that's fairly ludicrous. Have you looked around? We've got lots of work that needs to be done. Are we going to have jobs for all the work that needs to be done? That's a whole different issue. And we're going to have some nasty gaps there. So we can now think faster, know faster, and do faster than ever before in history. So where's our next generation jobs going to come from? Well, they're going to come from future industries. I look at, when I talk about future industries, I focus in on what I call the disruptive eight. And uh, I'll talk about a couple of these this morning. But uh, these are the ones that are creating entire new platforms for new job creation. We'll start with flying drones. I wrote a column uh, a few months back on 192 future uses for flying drones. 
And we started off with this simple question. If we add a video projector to a drone, what capabilities does that give us? And I was thinking, well, a video projector to a drone. Um, we could use it in concerts. We could use it in visual arts performances. But then it occurred to me that if we have a wealthy person walking down the road, we could have that drone fly over in front of them and project marketing messages and advertisements in front of that person everywhere they go. It could become the most annoying form of advertising ever invented. So we probably don't want to go there. But then it occurred to me that every time we add something to a drone, we give it additional capabilities. So what happens if we add speakers to a drone? How about if we add microphones or add infrared filters? or sensors. How about robotic arms? What capabilities does that give us? How about lasers? How about if we add wheels to a drone so it can drive on the ground as well as fly in the air? How about if we add an umbrella to it so we don't have to hold the umbrella, it just flies over top of us? If we go jogging at night, we can have a drone flying overhead that lights our path in front of us. Or how about if we add a tow line to a drone? This looks like fun, doesn't it? We'll probably see a lot of those in the future. And yeah, we just had Halloween, so. Um, the one I thought was really cool, this would be flying out of a prison. I think this would be appropriate. <laughs> um, we hear a lot about drone delivery, and Amazon had their first delivery, uh, commercial delivery, in December of last year. Now, they made it real simple. The drone just landed in a field in Australia. It was real easy for it to land there. Um, but I think where there's lots of restrictions on flying things, you can only handle six pounds, and I think we're going to have a lot more ground-based delivery. Uh, let me show you this one here. So this lady ordered something online and this little bot sent her a text message saying it's being delivered. So she walks out, she just happens to be home at this time. She walks out and it recognizes her and then it delivers the package and then it takes off. Isn't that just the cutest little drone delivery ever? Yeah, but um, Switzerland's actually looking to deliver mail with their drones. Um, they have lots of mountains, lots of problem areas to deliver mail to. But where is it okay to deliver that package? Where is it okay to put it? Could we have to put it on a driveway? Could we have to put it on a porch? Um, how about if there's dogs? What if it's raining out? What if you live in an apartment complex? What if you're in an office building? Where is it okay to put that package? Uh, I worked with a, a friend that was um, an inventor that was working on this problem about a decade ago. And one of the designs that we came up with was one for a park bench that would just look as a normal park bench. And when a drone was going to deliver something, the seat would lift up, you put a package in there, and then it flies off. Emergency beer drones, we all need those once in a while. So we have the potential to eliminate forest fires altogether. See, we can have drones flying overhead that are spotting any hot spots. So that's once we spot them, rather than let it turn into a giant blaze, we can fly in a fire extinguisher drone and put it out right when it first starts. This is a, a flying drone that's using sound waves to put out fire. We're going to see lots of experimental stuff like this in the future, too. Um, when a city gets a call, the first, an emergency call, the first response will be to get eyes on it. We'll fly a drone up there to get eyes on what's going on. Uh, uh, when there's an avalanche, emergency rescue, rather than putting people in harm's way, we'll put drones out there. Um, all the news organizations are going to be wanting to get the first live coverage of whatever incident is happening. It could be a plane crash. But then eventually, they're going to be sending in drones with screens on them, and the screen, they'll fly up, and they'll want to interview people, and they'll have a friendly news anchor on the screen talking to people within minutes of some incident happening. 
emergency puppy rescue. Um, agriculture is going to be one of the hot areas. I mean, we can monitor growing crops um, a, a thousand miles away. Um, if we can apply herbicides and pesticides with great precision with drones. Uh, a few scans over a field, we can tell where the uh, diseases are, where the bugs are. We can monitor how much fertilizer is on the field or how much moisture. Um, we can monitor livestock on the other side of the world. Um, we can send drones up where it's really hard for people to get to. Like on the top of windmills, we can go up there and scan things in a few seconds rather than taking an hour or two for somebody to climb up there. Uh, we can look at dangerous areas, um, high voltage areas. We can do thermal scans on buildings. Uh, structural integrity tests. We can monitor construction projects on the other side of the world. Um, emergency medical drones, if somebody is having an issue on a, on a golf course, we can fly in a drone with emergency medical supplies. If they're having a heart attack, we can fly in a defibrillator drone to shock them back to health. Um, when there's some big incident on a highway, rather than trying to get an, an ambulance there, we can fly in an ambulance drone and get it right to the danger spot. Now, ambulance drones are being worked on today. They're not ready for prime time just yet, but very soon. Environmental cleanup, people have to take breaks. They have to sleep. These things can be working 24-7. This one's referred to as the Roomba of the ocean. We can go along and just suck all the crap out of the ocean. So we have to understand the full spectrum of drones. We have drones that will fly right at the edge of the atmosphere, 80, 90,000 foot altitude above the weather pattern. So theoretically, they could fly above a hurricane, above all the traffic patterns. And because they're solar powered, they're going to be able to stay up for up to five years at a time. These are being worked on by Airbus, Boeing, Google, Facebook, and some other companies as well. We also have the really heavy duty drones that are gonna be able to move shipping containers. Um, even to the point where they can actually move houses, or in this case, a houseboat, down to the really tiny drones, the ones that are so small that we have to keep our windows closed in the summer to keep the damn drones out. <laughs> <laughs> if we assume that every major city is going to have 50,000 drones flying over it on a daily basis at some point in the future, then what is the role and responsibility of that city with dealing with those drones? Um, what are the legal privacy barriers? How close can they get to things? Um, as an example, I don't want drones flying over my business, my house, very close. But if I'm having a heart attack, I want that defibrillator drone to get real close to me. So how do we, how do we resolve those issues? Um, when, is, when do we have the right to shoot a drone out of the air? More importantly, when do we have an obligation to shoot it out of the air? And who decides if a drone is actually being helpful or being menacing? As an example, is this drone actually burning trash off the power lines or is it trying to cut through the power lines? Who gets to decide that? I would like to shoot that one out of the air, but I, that's just me. <laughs> um, and cities in the future are going to have drones flying over them on a regular basis that they control. Um, and we're going to start being able to create digital models of city as they scan over with lots of sensors and everything. And these digital models are going to get much more sophisticated in the future um, to the point where we can actually create search engines for the physical world. And we'll be able to search on attributes that we are currently not able to even consider searching on. I want something that smells like this. I want something that tastes like this. I want something with this harmonic vibration, with this specific gravity, with this uh, level of reflectivity. And then we'll be able to ask our search engines questions like, did that tornado cause damage to City Hall 20 minutes ago? Where is that rabies-infected dog in the city right now? What is the heaviest traffic intersection in the city? What caused the fire at 22nd and Oak Street? Uh, doing a stalker report, how close did John Doe get to Jane Doe? An infrastructure report, what's the most dangerous bridge in the city today? Lots of jobs are going to go away. 
surveying jobs, delivery services, policemen, firefighters, security guards, lots of jobs will disappear. At the same time, we're gonna start creating lots of new jobs. Uh, data command center operators, data analysts, um, privacy monitors, uh, traffic optimizers, lots of new jobs being created. The most important is that of the snot bot operator. Now I know in Palm Springs here what problem we have with whales in the area here, um, but the snot bot operator actually flies over and actually tests the emissions coming out of the blowhole of whales. And we're gonna start seeing drone command centers. Um, every, lots of organizations are not just gonna be buying, buying one drone, they're gonna be buying fleets of drones. Every police department, every news organization, every sports team, every national park will have fleets of drones, college campuses, farmers, airports, uh, construction companies, shipping docks, they're all gonna have their own fleets of drones. So what is a future drone command center gonna look like? We can only guess what these things might look like, but it's gonna create lots of new jobs. So how long before we reach the first billion drones in the world? Not that far away, 2030, 2032, somewhere in that range. Keep in mind that drones don't just fly in the air, they also roll on the ground, they stick to the side of a building, they float in a river, they dive underwater, they jump onto the side of a building. I've seen them jump onto two-story buildings. They can climb a tree and they can attach themselves like parasites to the sides of train ships, airplanes. Every drone in the future, virtually everyone will have multiple capabilities. This is a quick scenario about drones in the future because sometime in the future we're all gonna have our own fleet of swarm, uh, a fleet of drones, it's a swarm bot. So if you think about getting up in the morning, you take a shower, your swarm comes and it'll dry you off. And as it dries you off, then it will also fix your hair, put on your makeup, it'll shave you. Um, and then it will assemble itself as your clothing. Depending on what mood you're in, it will decide what fashion, what color it should be. And then if you decide to go somewhere, um, this drone swarm, then will become your protection, it will become your communication system, and it will fly you to wherever you wanna go. This is a Superman scenario. So I happen to like that idea. So that's sometime a little farther down the road. But driverless cars are also drones. So I wrote a column a few months back on 128 things that will disappear in a driverless car era. Now, this, when I talk about disappear, this is over the next two to three decades, because it takes a long time to transition through all of this hardware. But if you can imagine 10 years from now, stepping out in front of your house, you punch into your smartphone, I wanna go to work, I wanna go to school, I wanna go shopping, a driverless car comes and picks you up, takes you to where you wanna go, and from there it picks somebody else up and takes them to where they wanna go. We transition from a just-in-case mindset, I have a car in my garage just in case I need to go somewhere, to a just-in-time mindset. I can summon a vehicle at any time that I need it. Right in that line of thinking is the most disruptive technology in all history. More disruptive than the invention of the wheel, more disruptive than the invention of electricity or the car itself because it will affect more people in a shorter period of time than any other technology. Now, Bob Lutz, the former chairman of, uh, vice chairman of General Motors, he says we're approaching the end of the automotive era. I don't think it's that, that uh, uh, dim, but I think it's, uh, we're in for a major transition here. So where are we at? Uh, this is Hyundai's autonomous car that was introduced in January. Uh, Volvo's testing cars in Sweden this year. Ford's testing them in Europe. Uh, General Motors is testing them on snow and ice conditions. BMW has formed a consortium with Intel. Uh, this is Google self-driving car company called Waymo. Um, Baidu is a Chinese company, a big search engine company. They're testing cars in China. Uh, this was introduced uh, in the Geneva Auto Show. This is VW's model called Cedric. Now I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's kind of ugly. Um, and then it occurred to me, as yes, we no longer own our own cars, then 
we care far less about what the car looks like on the outside and far more about what we can do on the inside. And getting in and out of these cars is going to be a, a, a huge consideration. And Elon Musk says that before the end of this year, he still has a month and a half, that he's going to have a fully self-driving Tesla that drives from Los Angeles to New York City with no human intervention. So this is what a fully self-driving Tesla looks like today, if you haven't seen this before. You see the guy with his hands on his lap there, the real nervous guy there? <laughs> so with, with all of this technology, we need to develop a level of trust. That's going to take time. It's not going to happen instantly. Naturally, they speeded this one up because there's no way in hell they can go that fast. So. 263 companies have been staking their, their future on driverless technology, lots of the major companies, and, um, and this number is growing on an almost daily basis here. Lots of jobs disappearing, taxi drivers, Uber, Lyft, bus courier jobs, so lots of things going down, but this is over the next two to three decades, valet jobs, rental car companies, um, insurance companies, um, auctions are going to uh, decline, credit managers, loan underwriters, um, even the dealerships, we're going to start seeing lots of those start to disappear. Again, over the next two to three decades. They can transition into something else, but we'll see if that happens. Uh, I hate to see these guys go. I really like these guys. <laughs> Served a valuable purpose. Now, Volvo has said that they're going to be, by 2020, they're going to be creating the world's first death-proof cars. Now, as we baby step our way into the driverless era, we're going to be adding lots of uh, collision avoidance systems. And whether or not we actually achieve total death-proof cars by 2020, uh, I certainly applaud their effort. Um, gas stations, car washes, oil change places, over 10% of retail is car-related. These will start to disappear. Now, we'll still have a need for these services, but it becomes a B2B operation rather than a B2C, so it won't be customer-facing. Um, a lot of gas stations will disappear, service centers, emissions testing, um, parking lots go away. You know, 14% of Los Angeles is parking lots, so lots of high-priced real estate will come up for grabs. Um, so lots of this stuff will start going away. Handicap parking. Now let's get into this a little bit more. Because we're going to start seeing lots of fleet owners, the fleet owners that will own you know, 200,000 cars, 500,000 cars, a million cars, these guys are going to have lots of influence on how cars are designed. And because 86% of the cars on the road today just have one person in them, we're going to, we're going to see some cars that are designed for just one person. Now, that person can stay very productive in that car. They can watch movies, play video games, or just sleep, but it'd just be a one-person car. Now, parking lots, when they go away, we're going to start adding what I call queuing stations to the front of buildings so that we'll have cars lined up uh, ready to go if somebody comes out of the building and just jump in and take off. Now, if a lot of heavy traffic, then we're going to have uh, cars that are designed for uh, a special lane for handicapped people, a special lane for moms with kids, and so on. Um, looks like electric cars are going to dominate. That's what it looks like from right now. And somewhere between 2030 and 2035, we're going to start seeing the first highways that are designated as driverless only. Um, as we looked at this, we started doing the numbers on it. Um, a car that's picking up people and dropping them off 24-7 could very likely put on 1,000 miles in a single day on a car. That means after 10 months, we have 300,000 miles on that one car. So what's the life expectancy of these cars? We don't know yet, but uh, that's, that's going to be a lot. One autonomous car will replace 30 traditional cars, um, but we'll go through these cars much quicker. And then uh, I'll do the math on this last one here. It's only, it'll only take 15,000 cars in a population of a million people to replace 50% of peak rush hour traffic. Uh, during the rest of the day, it'll be much more than 50%, but that's a much lower number than most people are thinking. So just 15,000 cars for the peak rush hour traffic for a million people. 
Now that may not stay that way for very long and that presumes that we have an operating system where the cars are in the right place in the city at any given time. It'll affect lots of things in cities. Average airport in the United States, 41% of the revenue comes from parking and transportation services. All of this starts to disappear over the next two to three decades. So somebody that can understand what to do with these giant parking garages that they built at airports, they're gonna be in high demand in the future. Lots of consequences of distracted driving. Um, 2015, we had 38,000 deaths, 4.4 million injuries. If we do the math on that, it works out to right around half a trillion dollars a year that we're spending repairing people after car accidents. Now, nobody's sorry to see that go, but that works out to one out of every six dollars in the healthcare industry. Now, cities are gonna be hit really hard with this. Over 50% of their revenue will be going away. Um, lots of the sales tax goes away, all the traffic violation money goes away. Um, all of this starts to change and they lose half their income. Teenagers will be some of the early adopters um, and parents are gonna actually prefer this. But with teenagers, things go wrong. I mean, how can things go wrong with teenagers? At what age is it okay for a child to get into a driverless car by themselves? If I have a fully autonomous system that recognizes a parent on one end and a teacher on the other end, can I put a six-year-old kid in a driverless car and then for how long? Is 10 minutes okay? Is a half hour too long? This is what an intersection will look like in a driverless car era. It's kind of how they drive in India right now, but. Incidentally, India has totally banned autonomous vehicles. Take too many jobs. And then drone taxis. Um, Airbus has said that they'll have drone taxis for sale. We had the first demonstration of a drone taxi in Dubai about a month ago. Um, but it, this is not what Airbus is coming up with, but this is one concept they're working on. I thought I'd show this to you. I think I'll take two of them. <laughs> All right, we're hearing lots about high-speed tube transportation, and we have several companies that are competing for this and several countries that are competing to be the first that will have tube transportation services around their cities, uh, between their countries. Um, we currently ship more things. Um, we, we ship water, we ship oil, we ship sewage. All of these things we ship, so why not people and freight? It's actually a, a, good, uh, a good question. Um, so these are the five primary, primary companies. Uh, Daryl Oster was actually in this quite a while ago and he's working on a, a more streamlined version where people can actually go 4,000 miles an hour inside of a tube. Uh, Hyperloop is supposed to go around 800 miles an hour. And the very last one here, Arivo, um, Brogan Van Brogan just a couple days ago announced that they're gonna be putting a pilot project in Denver, that's where I'm from, and, uh, and they'll have the first pilot done by 2021, so we'll see. But that'll go much slower, to just go between some of the cities in Colorado. But I wanna show you this uh, quick video here, uh, give you an idea of what they're thinking about. The Hyperpod is the long-haul vehicle of the Hyperloop One system. It is a comfortable and safe transport hull for passenger and cargo pods. All levitation and guidance systems fit seamlessly underneath, 
Secure airlocks are at each end. Inside the hyperpod, passenger and cargo pods can glide smoothly at airline speeds right to their destination. Is that our transportation of the future? Well, maybe. Um, so these are being designed. There's lots of competitions going on around the world by different colleges. Um, these things can go underwater. They can go above water. They can go in tunnels. Um, there's competition to design what they'll look like on the inside. We haven't got any firm designs yet on it. Since they go so darn fast, making corners like this is going to be problematic. They need to be very very uh, very linear, very straight. Um, and as Daryl Oster talks about being space travel on Earth, um, Hyperloop can actually, uh, it's bus sized containers hauling things as large as shipping containers um, and uh, uh, traveling from New York to Istanbul as an example in, in eight hours. But um, ET3 could go from New York to Istanbul in as little as two hours uh, at 4,000 miles an hour. We'll see what, what picks up. Uh, ET3 is more car-sized uh, vehicle, scaled down into a much smaller tube. Um, but this has the potential to become the world's largest infrastructure project. As soon as we have a very uh, clear leader then every country in the world shows up on the doorstep of this company that's building these, and they want to be part of this network. It ends up being a 50 to 70 year build out, um, massive investment, um, hundreds, uh, actually trillions of dollars, but it all pays for itself as it goes, employing hundreds of millions of people. Um, so I'm going to leave you with these five questions here. So what percentage of consumers will still own cars in 10 years? 20 years, and 30 years. Will gas-powered vehicles eventually disappear? What role will auctions play in expanding car fleets? Will auto dealers start selling and repairing drones? Um, and keep in mind that if FedEx and UPS gets into the drone delivery business, they're going to want drones that can make 50,000 trips before they put them out to pasture. Um, we haven't seen that commercial industrial grade drone just yet. And then will auto auctions also work with drones? Um, I'll let you sort through those on your own and feel free to come and talk to me later. But as my, one of my favorite physicists, Max Planck, likes to say, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. The future is ours to write. Uh, the future is never a destination, it's always a journey, so it's always constantly changing. We can never say that we've arrived there. By 2030, the average person will own printed clothing, live in a printed house, have packages delivered by drones, own more than one robot, work as a freelancer, frequently use a driverless car, and will be capable of accomplishing 10 times as much as the average person today. So we're entering a period of unprecedented opportunity. So why is this so important? It's because humanity is going to change more in the next 20 years than in all human history. But at the same time, our risk factors are increasing. As we add more technology to our lives, more things can break, more things can go wrong. And our children's children who haven't even been born yet, they're counting on you. They're counting on the people in this room to make great decisions. As Steve Jobs says, is right now is one of those times when you are influencing the future. But sometimes our best efforts just look a lot like this.
pretty much just like that, right? <laughs> so a quick plug for my book, Epiphany Z. I have a few copies with me. They're $20. Uh, the money goes to our scholarship fund at the Da Vinci Institute. We're a nonprofit and have an educational system there. Uh, so feel free to stop by and, and talk to me afterwards. And um, any of you that like more information, you can sign up for my free newsletter. And I thank you very much for having me here today. Thank you. That's enough. Anyway, but that's pretty good. Uh, da Vinci painting at auction, $450 million, breaking all prior records for anything ever sold at auction anywhere. Um, Thank you for uh, having me here today. I'm frankly terrified to be up here. First of all, I'm badly outnumbered by all of you and all the exits are back there. Uh, secondly, you collectively in this room have several centuries more uh, understanding of the auction industry uh, than I do. So I appreciate the, um, uh, the faith put in me by uh, the NAAA's uh, leadership and executive committee, et cetera, to uh, retain me to do this uh, work. So I take that responsibility seriously and I'll try to do a um, Good job, uh, but I'm also a bit uh, terrified as I have uh, 65 slides in 45 minutes, so uh, that's not actually going to work. So think of this as um, uh, not so much the report itself, but the Hollywood uh, trailer, as it were, for the entire report. We'll see at the end how you can get a, we'll re be releasing copies of this and things like that. So don't try to really to soak up all of this as it flies by. I'll try to slow down and hit some of the most important points, but I do apologize for uh, the pace we're about to, um, to go through. Okay, auction of tomorrow. Uh, we're now stepping down from uh, the uh, grand uh, planetary wide scale of Tom's presentation, uh, which looks out decades to um, uh, one focused on this industry, looking out sort of in the five to 10 year range. Auction of tomorrow. I'll go through uh, in the uh, 45 minutes, um, seven topics. Uh, the one we'll dwell uh, most of the time on is Five, the future, of course, but just to hit some of these other things first. First of all, the project history of this, why am I here, why are you here listening to this? Uh, NAAA instigated this after um, we, uh, they saw the uh, NADA report, Dealership of Tomorrow, uh, which uh, started in 2015 and wrapped up uh, earlier this year on how automotive retailing might change. And um, Tom mentioned uh, dealers, uh, for example, in his commentary, and this is a deep dive into the next, say, 10 years for um, franchised new car dealerships. Um, and so NAAA said, uh, can we try this out for this industry? The goal was to provide, just as Tom mentioned as well, thought starters for member planning. There's a forecast in here. There's many forecasts in here. Probably a lot of them will be wrong. Uh, but the point was to provide thought starters for planning uh, and, and, and thinking about the future. As I interviewed a lot of you as part of this project, um, you know, I got the pr impression that you know, for you guys, uh, the future is the end of the month and the distant future is the end of the quarter. So this was to try to kind of wrench people out of just getting the business done and looking further ahead. As uh, Frank Hackett put it, the central question is, do we need to reinvent the auction? Uh, over the next, say, five or 10 years. Uh, as the spoiler alert, the answer is no. Uh, and now anybody who's not interested in the rest of the presentation can, can leave um, uh, or pilot a, a drone outside. Uh, but that's the central question and uh, there's a lot into the answer, but uh, there, there's where we start from. Uh, how we did the project, I keep saying we because even though I am responsible for any of the errors of interpretation or uh, other errors in this, um, it is a group effort, and I thank all the people who uh, uh, allowed me to interview them at some depth. There were 35 main interviews, that is interviews of an hour or more, uh, various site visits to auctions, and a whole bunch of uh, desk research. Um, though uh, less than I expected, uh, it's fascinating to me that the auto industry is so huge uh, that even a relative sliver of the industry, such as the auction uh, industry, is gigantic as well, but there's not a lot written about your industry. So it was very interesting to come up with a lot of primary insight. Credentials you already heard about from me, so I won't repeat those uh, as well. Uh, context. Uh, the focus here is just USA, not globally. Uh, we're not doing salvage, and we're looking just five to ten years out. 
Uh, the roles are you are the industry experts who sort of brought uh, all these topics to my attention, and then I tried to structure them and put together a forecast as a result. But again, any errors are my responsibility. Um, my bias here. Uh, now, uh, Tom is professionally interested in what could happen and sort of looks at the glass half full going forward. I will announce my bias up front and in today's political and political environment, everybody assumes that anything anybody says is motivated by some hidden agenda, so I'll declare mine, and that is, I tend to think that at least in our industry, I won't speak about hyperloops and, and drones and things like that, uh, within our industry, we tend to over-predict the rate of change in our industry, that in, our industry is perpetually has been s slower to change than we expect. That may be changing, and thus this report. I'll come back to that. Special topics here uh, I want to address up front uh, to dispose of them. The safety issue, of course, is a major issue, and so that came up in some of the interviews, uh, but um, uh, I am absolutely confident that the whole issue of safety in auctions will be resolved in the near future, and so we don't have it hanging out there a decade from now. And indeed, in the session after this one, safety will be addressed in depth. So it isn't omitted from this because I think it's not important, but because it is being handled. Also, and now this is a, a very uh, place where I must speak very carefully, in um, speaking with a variety of you, let us say, um, uh, issues of industry structure and competition among members came up, and I'll just leave it at that, uh, and I'll say uh, the following uh, carefully worded statement. I heard in several interviews concerns about issues of industry structure, the mix of larger and smaller members and the competitive challenges such as relations with consigners and challenges created by changing fees and costs. Uh, while I appreciate these concerns, it was clear to me they are best addressed, as always, within the mechanisms of the NAAA, rather than by an external researcher such as myself. Rest assured that I've, these concerns have been relayed to the executive leadership of the NAAA. So um, we heard what you said. It has been relayed to the NAAA, which is the best forum for the resolution. Okay, onward. My bias, forecasts often overshoot. Again, this is in our industry. In other industries, maybe such as the record industry, uh, totally blindsided, or maybe possibly the publishing industry, that may be a different case. But here, we tend to overpredict the rate of change. So in the last 25 years, automotive pundits, such as myself, uh, guilty as charged, have predicted that by now, cars would be built to order. We've gone the exact opposite direction. Fewer cars are ordered now than before. More are bought from inventory, which makes no sense uh, in, a in a theoretical way. People expected the public six dealership chains would sweep the board, but their market share stays at 9%. We have not consolidated the automotive dealership chain world. Um, uh, it was predicted relentlessly in the 80s and 90s that dealers by now will be multi-branded. Ford, GM, and Chrysler all are under one roof. Hasn't happened. Um, I'll skip ahead. We heard the phrase peak driving brought up over and over again, and peak driving we thought we had hit it in the United States, um, and uh, we indeed did drop at the Great Recession, and then we have resumed growth in total vehicle miles traveled. Now it's something like 3.2 trillion miles. Uh, this is different in different parts of the world. Europe is plateauing for sure. Asia is still soaring upward. Um, we predicted electric vehicles would dominate by now, and I do believe that electric vehicles will play a much larger role in the future, but currently they're at six-tenths of 1% market share if we combine both plug-in hybrids and battery vehicles. So, and we predicted over and over again, millennials won't buy cars, they'll stay in the basement playing Call of Duty um, instead of getting in cars, and now they're the single largest segment of the market. So I just bring these things up to humble myself, if not you, uh, that we've had a tendency to kind of get frothy and panicky about our predictions, and then we have to pull back. Uh, maybe though, um, the time to be frothy and panicky has returned. But that's my bias. Okay, uh, I look for equilibrium rather than extrapolation. That is, I don't like to just extrapolate linearly a trend, but look for the balance. So for example, I look at the recent uh, last year or so of decline in the sale of electronic books and the resurgence in paper books, which people thought would you know, not happen, for example. Okay, um, summary, spoiler alert. Uh, this is the whole thing wrapped up in one page, and then you can um, uh, skip the rest if you want. I look at the industry both from inside the industry and outside the industry. From inside the industry, we'd say 
mostly stable next five or 10 years, though it's hard to see how profitability could be higher in the future, meaning probably lower. We'll come back to all of this. The long-term flow of used cars should be stable, and all these will go back into detail. Sources and destinations will shift but remain in total solid. Both digital and upstream remarketing will grow somewhat, and there is a vast chasm of difference of opinion in this room on the rate of that process we'll come back to. As a result, profits are probably lo lower, change does definitely occur for sure, and probably there is more consolidation in the industry. From outside the industry, things impacting it from externally are dropping from the sky if a drone falls on you. Um, uh, the shifts look like they are probably positive for this industry in the five to 10 year period or so, but very volatile, hard to predict. So a firm like Uber probably doesn't know where it's going to be in two months, let alone in 20 years, so for us to project it is pretty tricky. Uh, but uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, con autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, mobility services like Lyft and Uber and connected cars, net look neutral to positive for the industry. Um, uh, other topics are stable, but stay alert. <coughs> we'll come back to those. Okay. That consensus, probably evolution rather than revolution. A high rate of change, certainly. There's a lot of speakers here this week, and there's a lot of booths in the halls next door about blockchain, about uh, mobility services, et cetera, et cetera. So plenty of change, but is there a need to kind of fundamentally you know, reinvent uh, the auction over the next time frame? Probably not. Okay. One thing I look at, and it's interesting because uh, as I w walk back and forth between inside this hall and outside this hall, inside the hall I heard Tom talking about an almost Buck Rogers a sense of potential for the future to be um, really interesting and exciting for the world. Um, I, except I don't know about the 10 times more productive during the day. I think whenever we get more productive, we just spend more time on Facebook. But anyway, I'll we'll leave that aside. Uh, but then I look out in the hallway out here and I see the plaques and the silver gavels and the, and the uh, wall and the um, uh, crystal vases of the history of this industry. And I do believe that especially in automotive, because we have such an enormous installed base out there, a quarter of a million uh, garages, 250 million cars on the road, uh, that history to some extent drives a lot of the future as well as the future driving uh, the present. So we're coming at it from both directions. So I'm not sure if I'm walking backwards into the future or looking, it's sort of back to the future. It gets, time travel gets very confusing. So I'll just say the past also shapes our future. Themes from your past include, and I learned a lot about the past of this industry and this work, efficiency. You always get more efficient. There's no argument ever for let's be less efficient or less cost effective in the future. So there's always a relentless drive in that direction. Also, everyone in this room competes with everyone else and collaborates with everyone else. I could not ever get a flow out of this industry that did not look like spaghetti on the wall. Um, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it was, I, I would be talking to people who had, in one sentence would shift from, and so that's how we drive the auctions out of business, and we'll work with them as we do that. Uh, you know, uh, it just, so, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, holding of opposing viewpoints in the brain at the same time. Um, which makes it hard to forecast what's going on. Trust, trust, I heard this word over and over again, is all aspects of it is core to the auction value proposition. Without trust, buyers and sellers cannot come together and you form that glue. Um, digitization, we'll come back to this, what that means, and upstream remarketing are inextricably linked. You really can't do one without, you can't do the latter without the former. Um, everything cycles up and down. Uh, market, in an up market, let's all do upstream remarketing. In a down market auction, will you please take my, you know, 1,000 line green Dodge Neons? And uh, so that was also important to not just sort of come up with a flat line to the future, but we'll cycle up and down around that. Services continually added and upgraded. Uh, one person said to me, actually, um, that as cars get more and more digital, maybe one of the feature, future functions of a car dealership will be to reboot your car. Um, which I first I laughed and I thought, yeah, no, that's really interesting. You know, as the car loads up with data, when you sell the car, is all the data about every place you've been to and where you are still somewhere in a, a silicon chip in the car? Uh, anyway, um, so we may have the Geek Squad, uh, you know, uh, recon commission. Um, and action, auctions adapt always. Let me uh, go into more detail here. 
steady evolution of adaptation in this industry. This industry has actually, uh, though um, other people have mentioned, you know, we're facing a period of rapid change. You've been dealing with rapid change for decades. Uh, from 10 acres auctions to 100 acres, from once a week to more often, from minutes to transact to seconds, from small lots to vast fleets, from independence to chains and independence, from transactions only to transactions and multiple services, from sort of a wild west digital. So it's an industry that already knows how to change, and I think you will uh, be pretty ad adept in handling change in the future. You do have a history of rapid growth. Uh, this is just units uh, transacted um, uh, over time from almost nothing. It's interesting, we think of the auto industry as very old, but this is actually one of the younger industries around. Um, there's quite a few people in this room who's, uh, who saw within their entire lifetime this entire industry appear and grow. Uh, odometer issues tackled helped spur fur further growth, the program car explosion, of course. Maybe I shouldn't say explosion around cars. Um, uh, after seeing that video of the car just manly itself, and then the leasing explosion, and the question is, now what? But you've handled rapid growth and rapid change so far, so uh, buck up as far as the future goes. Well, after a past growing, a present slowing. Certainly, you know, volumes go up and down, and at the Economist panel yesterday, we're talking about volumes, and, you know, but it's hardly really exciting to hear, oh yeah, this year, volumes could be up 2%. You know, that's great, but this is not like what we've seen in the past. So currently this sort of plateauing, and maybe that's a, a chance to look at the future and see what do we need to do differently or what will happen in the future if this continues onward. Okay, so into the future, the core findings. Um, uh, and I'll take them again from this inside and outside the industry section. A, this may sound like a dumb question, will there be cars for us to remarket? Uh, well, as Tom pointed out, quite a few people out there, mostly on the left coast, excuse me, the west coast, um, uh, California, uh, think maybe we will just have very, very few units on the road and they'll be frantically scurrying around and there won't be much of a volume of used cars. So that's something to look at. Um, who will be selling and buying? We know who the usual suspects are now. Are they the same in the future? Uh, how will they be remarketed? Uh, does this industry play as much of a role as it has in the past? Um, what are the implications for auctions? And this points a little bit towards a question Frank said many of the members had, which is, you know, on balance, if someone offers me something for my auction right now, do I head for the exit now or wait? And this is a core question for the dealership of tomorrow study. A lot of dealers saying, is it going to be as much fun in the future as it was in the past? Uh, second, outside the industry, we'll talk about the four horsemen again. Uh, horsemen and cars comes up again here. And then other topics if we have time, but I think we'll probably have to skip over those. Okay, so will there be cars for us to remarket? Uh, well, if history is any guide, yes. Back to 1975, uh, sort of running at uh, 35 to 45 million used cars a year in the United States churning along. So if history is any guide, we don't see any particular downward trend here. Um, uh, but let's uh, talk about the future. Uh, for 2017, as uh, Cox and other economists mentioned yesterday, looking at 39 million, uh, let's uh, look a little further out. Uh, there's positive factors for used car volumes. And remember now, I'm just looking inside the industry. I'm not bringing in those four horsemen yet, okay? So let's pretend autonomous cars, mobility services, and things like that don't exist yet. We'll bring them in later. New car sales, uh, there are relatively few people who forecast out to 2025, uh, but we're looking at a pretty much a steady uh, level of 17 million. Uh, new cars, which of course is, you can't have a used car unless you start with a new car, uh, looking pretty stable out there. Uh, the good news is it's pretty stable. The bad news is it's shrinking relative to the population of the United States. Increasingly, new cars are bought by the wealthy. Uh, in my mind, the shorthand for this is cars become more like houses. Uh, wealthy people build new ones and everybody else buys used. Um, but anyway, stable at 17, more or less, with cycles. Historically stable used car volumes, as we've already seen. Uh, growing U.S. population, we're at 325 million now. Uh, by 2030, um, thanks to um, uh, natural birth, uh, domestic births and immigration, well, maybe just local births. That's my only political joke, okay? Just one little tiny one. As far as I'll go, I won't touch that anymore. But in, hypothetically, there could be immigration. But anyway, the population of the United States grows and that, you know, everything else being equal, 
uh, creates demand for transportation. Vehicle miles traveled, as mentioned, after it took a dip right after the recession, has resumed. Born to run, I guess. Um, 3.2 trillion, trillion miles in 2016, looking for 3.7 trillion miles in 2030. Um, uh, truly an amazing amount of movement. Um, growing units in operation, IHS has 295 million in the fleet by 2023, and academic researchers says 315 by 2030. Uh, negatives, well, of course, we're probably going to have a recession out there somewhere. That'll take a hit on us for a while. Uncertainty around household formation. Um, this is a big driver of long-term uh, car growth. Uh, believe it or not, and this will sound kind of morbid or something, but divorce is great for the car industry because a household which has two people living together with one car, they split up and they each have a car. Uh, so uh, things like that actually drive long-term demand for vehicles. And then impact of ride share and autonomy we'll come back to. So, uh, A, will there be cars for us to remarket? Yes, with fluctuations around that level. Who will be selling and buying? Let's start with the customers. We can't talk about the industry's health unless we know the health of uh, the customers. So, you know who they are, of course, and a lot of them are here today. Rental, lease, repossession, commercial and government fleet, uh, and then buyers and sellers, both dealers of both kinds, the mysterious wholesalers, and then we'll come back to person to person. So I'm just going to touch very, very quickly here sound bites on the health of each area. Rental seems to be pretty stable. Uh, of course, there are experts in the rental industry in this room and the rooms nearby that exceed my knowledge by two or three orders of magnitude, but simplistically, over time, rental has been growing faster than the economy as a whole. As with more GDP, there is more travel. So rental fleet in 1987, 800,000 units. By 2016, 2.3 million. That's a growth of almost three times, even as real GDP only went up by two. With more wealth, people move around more uh, and faster. Um, uh, unit uptake, and therefore, the, the stuff going into the remarketing area, has grown more slowly because we've been stretching out uh, rental act, uh, service periods. As you know, the Hertz average in 2005 was 11 months. Last year, 16 months. This cannot go on indefinitely, of course. Um, and then um, an average mileage at disposal, as you know, and is tracked by um, you know the various information services in Mannheim and Odessa, et cetera, going up as well. The challenge of the mobility services, and whenever I say mobility services, think Uber, Lyft, and all their uh, other types, is so far minimal. Hertz calculates it's only 4% of their market. Um, uh, you've seen industry statistics that say for every Hertz rental, there are like 15 Uber trips or something, but we forget that uh, we have to count correctly. Uh, if a business person flies to Tallahassee, takes an Uber from uh, the... Um, airport to the hotel, and then from the hotel to the business, and then from the business to the airport, that counts as three rentals, whereas if it was a rental car, it would count as one. So you have to make some adjustment there. Um, and so Hertz is, is so far maybe being foolishly blasé about this. But again, we can never assume that any company will sit there and say, oh, I'm about to be disrupted. I guess I'll just fold up because historical inevitability has doomed me. Right? So everybody always fights back, and companies can adapt. In the past, Avis saw Zipcar being a threat. They said, heck, we'll buy it. Uh, Hertz, currently, rents to Uber drivers. We can do that. And then you may have seen just recently Waymo, the autonomous vehicle uh, entity associated with Google, uh, just retained Avis to manage its fleet. So again, companies adapt and adjust. So rental I'm going to put in as stable or possibly growing. Leasing cycles up and down, and it was interesting hearing the Economist panel yesterday about how this is something that Wall Street just loves to chew on like a dog with a 14-year-old rawhide bone, you know, which is where's the leasing cycle going to go? Will there be a tsunami of off-lease cars? Used car values will fall to about $14 per vehicle and, you know, all whatever breaks loose. Uh, but over the longer period of time, I'll go for a uh, fairly stable here around a cycle. Yes, it goes up and down, but I think long term, my view, and I couldn't get too many people, I talked to quite a few experts here who would say, can you look past just the next two years, please, to 10 years out, uh, but I'll go with likely to grow. As America ages, and it's one thing we can forecast with absolute certainty, we will be an older country in 10 years, the luxury premium share of the market goes up, and with luxury premium share, up goes leasing, so maybe 30% is a new normal again with cycles. 
Uh, and also, as new mobility concepts come in, people get more comfortable with leasing. That is, if they get more comfortable with short-term ownership of vehicles, then leasing you know, is not so much of a leap as it might be for some people. So um, uh, more fleets mean more leased vehicles. If you do think that Uber will grow and grow, uh, anybody want to guess what percentage of all vehicle miles traveled in the United States right now are consumed by a combination of taxis, limousines, and all transportation network companies together, that is Uber and Lyft and the rest? Just under 1%. Okay, so there's a lot of press coverage, but watch for the actual uh, volume. But if you think those are going to grow, that'll be more leased vehicles. On the personal use side, more comfort with partial ownership implies more leasing. So, of course, we have Cadillac with its book service. You know, you can change from a CTS to a... I'm not even going to try to try to do Cadillac and Lincoln model names. I cannot figure them out. Um, I was so much happier with DeVille and Escalade, showing my age. Anyway, uh, but, you know, rotating ownership here, or, uh, of course, uh, FAIR, uh, the latest Scott Painter venture on uh, short-term ownership of vehicles. So that would, should drive up um, uh, lease volumes. Repossessions, of course, are always with us and remain cyclical for very clear reasons. I uh, won't say much more about that. Um, Commercial and government fleets, very, very complicated, and we know where the volumes are. Government tends to be steady volumes, very variety of internal and external auctions, commercial, uh, a lot of uh, fleet management usage there. So I'll just kind of skip past because I am watching the clock. Um, dealers, okay, new car dealers. What is the out expected health of the new car dealership? Well, we just happen to have this report by a brilliant gentleman uh, with the same name I have, so uh, we were able to... Um, so I got to tell you, with, when your name is Glenn Mercier, initials are a problem in this industry. Um, uh, Google keeps asking me when I'm going to update my website to reflect my service hours because they're convinced I am a garage. Um, GM Automotive, right? Why not? Um, new car de uh, dealer cyclical at uh, 15 million um, used units. Uh, what, what can we say about the new car dealership of the future? Again, maybe they get vaporized, but in our look ahead for the next 10 years, we'd say they remain the dominant new car channel. Direct sales, such as Tesla, do not take more than 10% of sales. Slow consolidation from 18,000 to maybe 16 and a half. Slow consolidation of ownership. Uh, it's been really slow. People thought they would just all be buying each other and exiting, um, and, uh, and uh, an increasing OEM control. Uh, is what the statement is here, privately owned company stores. By that meaning that um, car companies have exerted such growing amounts of control over a new car dealership uh, that uh, they look more and more like a McDonald's franchise than, you know, Joe's Ford of Palm Springs. I talked to one OEM executive who, of course, remained anonymous for this quote, and I said, were you going to Ford integrate and buy your dealerships and own them the way Tesla does? And he said, we already control 95% of what they do. Well, why would we buy them to get the last five? Uh, okay. Uh, so dealers looking relatively healthy uh, with low, at lower profitability. Uh, major risk, of course, is autonomy and mobility, which we'll come back to. Used car dealers, independent dealers, thank you, NIDA ADA, for all your help here. Cyclical at 14 uh, million. Uh, 70,000 entities out there, you know. Uh, Glenn's used car lot, you know, with a banner and a double wide, but 35,000 that are sort of, you know, serious in the business at 10 cars per month or more, a lot. The demise is often predicted. Uh, so many times I have seen predictions that, well, used car dealers will just be rolled up by some kind of CarMax entity, but they are a relentlessly resilient bunch. Uh, in the decade of, uh, 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 in the since our approximately a decade since the big recession, took out more, no more than five or ten percent, really, um, uh, holding their own. In 1995, they sold 16 million units. In 2016, they sold 16 million units. Um, now thriving right now, with the, right now with off lease flow, cheap and available capital, which is crucial to these businesses that are often undercapitalized. Um, low entry barriers, low operating costs, local savvy. Hard to consolidate. The only big player so far really is CarMax at 675,000 units. Relative to 14, you can see this has hardly been rolled up. Um, 
Risks, new entrants gain ground. Everybody's watching Carvana. I believe in one of the publications out there, um, uh, you can see a big profile on Carvana. And of course, everyone's worried about floor plan finance um, for uh, these firms because they are so dependent on that capital, not just the interest rates, but the availability of that financing. Um, though if we had to come up with another prediction which has been pers proven persistently wrong is how many times have we heard that inflation is about to take off and interest rates are about to rise. I know sooner or later this will happen, but we're up to about a decade now of predicting that. And uh, you know, let me know. Um, dedicated users of auctions, of course. Uh, but they are targeted, but I what I'm referring to as the app crew, and we'll come back to the app crew. You know who you are, okay? Wholesalers. Wholesalers fascinate me. If the auto industry as a whole, the OEMs, the Fords, and the Fiats of the world are very well known, the dealership industry is less well known. The auction industry is even less well known. When I told people I was working on this project, they'd say auto auctions, oh, like on the TV with a, a 1965 Ford Mustang, Barrett Jackson, right? That's what you mean? Said, no, it's a huge industry, and you don't know about it. And then I'd bring up wholesalers, and it, and uh, if several times in my interviews, I'd say, how many are there? And no one knows. Uh, so a fascinating uh, subsegment of the industry. That's why there's a question mark there, because I'm not quite sure I can put a handle on their volume. Um, the interviews, when I talk to you, since uh, it is hard to go to some place which has the count of these uh, people and what they're doing exactly. So if you know sources, you'll see an email address at the end of this presentation. Please send me information. Uh, interviews are almost 100% unanimous. This is not my opinion. This is the interviews I did from people in this room and elsewhere. That they provide very valuable services, such as trustworthy relationships, liquidity for cash-strapped dealers. dealers. One person said some of them are as banks as much as merchants. Fast transactions, inventory problem solving for overworked and hassled to use car managers, sometimes lower costs than auctions perhaps. Uh, minimal transportation, tra transportation hassle, here's the truck, we're ready to go, here's the check. Valuable services, but those services become less value as the industry gets more and more efficient was the assertion and it is hard ever, than ever to make money in arbitrage. So many people are out there with so many algorithms, apps, and computers trying to make prices transparent that it's harder and harder to kind of, you know, work in, uh, in the uh, interface among prices. Accordingly, theoretically, though we don't know how many there are, uh, their number should continue to dwindle, whatever that number is. Their future, don't expect rapid exit. As one person said, many have very low costs. Print a business card and you're ready to go. Uh, and so it's very easy to enter the business. Uh, we'll thrive the longest with the oldest cars, and of course the oldest cars continue to grow in number. Uh, and as always the case, the most efficient and nimble will survive. Uh, but the app crew, and I'll come back to that again, are maybe the next stage of wholesaler evolution. Uh, here's some quotes directly. Of course, everything, every interview, I promised every, every interviewee total anonymity, and this is the case. But here's some fun quotes. Wholesalers make money on mistakes, and we make fewer every day. Uh, they have better focus, better brains on used car prices than used car managers do. They are huge competitors of ours and huge customers. I don't get it. Buy a car at one auction, sell it elsewhere at another auction, make money doing it. How, do they, how does this happen? Uh, and then if they go away, yes, but who moves the cars? And if the lights turn out, uh, who will be able to see the wholesalers? That's kind of ominous. Uh, okay, all right. No, 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 you were okay where we were. Okay. All right, okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Person to person, okay, this is uh, 10 to 15 million a year, not traditionally of interest to this industry necessarily, but the flows are large. Traditionally steady, 29% of used car retail in 1996, 29% in 2016. But um, we buy your car options are proliferating and as more entities do this, we buy your car, these vehicles enter the, the remarketing flow directly. And so this should be a lift to volume. So um, the leader, CarMax, of course, sources about 55% of what it sells off the street by buying cars off the street. And though they have, I make, must make this clear, this is not something they've told me. I don't think they've disclosed this publicly, but we've figured it out uh, from other statements, are aiming to go to maybe as high as three quarters. CarMax essentially buying off the street and retailing directly. As of 2017, they have said they've done 25 million customer car appraisals in total. This is big. 
Also in the game are KBB, Instant Cash Offer, AutoNation will pay your car, Carvana, True Car, True Cash, et cetera. And we haven't even gotten to pedal, BB, Room, et cetera. So um, interesting that the extent more and more of these vehicles may enter the direct remarketing flow. That being said, there's always equilibrium. CarSense, which uh, now Penske owns, says we buy only 5% off the street. It's not right for us, so difference of opinion. Okay, so who will be selling and buying? A lot of shifting mix there, but by the time you add up the pluses and minuses, it looks stable overall, but a shifting mix of uh, vehicles. So now the key issue, how will they be remarketed? Um, so three major shifts here, and this is where I gotta pause just briefly and say uh, this, this area is where the chasm of opinions opened up widely in the interviews. Uh, I would say if there are three auction professionals in a room, there are at least four opinions. And, uh, and they're all firmly held, and they all contradict each other. So um, my challenge was try to knit a story together from this as opposed to just putting things in the blender and making green goo. Uh, so major differences of opinion. One is how far does online go? Two, how far does upstream remarketing go to the extent that that removes the vehicle from the auction flow and the app crew, which kind of combine both. You're probably wondering why I keep saying the app crew. It is not the latest rap band from At Atlanta. I, I, I will get to define it at some point. Uh, so one of the challenges with all this, of course, is the flow out is a mess. Uh, that is because it isn't just a matter of the farmer raises the wheat, it goes to Cargill, it goes to Wonder Bread, it goes to the grocery store and it goes to your table. Vehicles are flushing back and forth in the system all the time. So it's pretty hard to really come up with percentages um, uh, in these flows, uh, though I have certainly uh, tried. So let's take shift number one, digital. And by this we mean digital displacement of physical lanes, not enhancement. Simulcast is a tool or a supplement and simulcast and the other things like it. This is the pure online uh, auction, as it were. Uh, it, was, it was interesting that in the auction for the uh, Da Vinci painting at $450 million, the uh, winning bid came in by the advanced technology of the telephone. Um, anyway, uh, when I'm talking about autonomous vehicles, I like to start my remarks with a pretty lame joke, but there's not a lot of autonomous vehicle jokes out there, so you gotta go with what you can. Uh, and I, I start out saying, uh, I, today I came to you in a car that was voice operated taxi. <laughs> okay. It just depends how you position this stuff, right? Like, if you want to seem more than a competitor, just call yourself a disruptor. Ta-da, you know, here. Up, up goes the, uh, the PE. Um, there's a huge rift here between the digital and the physical camps. Most agree, D, digital is growing, but disagree where it will stop, or if ever. The digital camp says, what wins is efficiency? Doing things right. So whatever we're doing, you know, um, uh, uh, recon, transport, making a deal, whatever, doing it the most efficiently at the lowest cost, that's what people really want. That's what wins. And if it's inherently cheaper, and maybe if it isn't, well, we'll get there eventually. It's always on. It's not waiting for auction day. And when CRs are perfected, that holy grail day, uh, the conversion will accelerate. As car quality improves, more of the used car market can move to digital, et cetera. As fleets take more share, again, if Uber grows, they will push the market to digital, et cetera. Lanes as we know them will go away. Digital is just cheaper and safer. That's the digital camp. Uh, the physical camp, effectiveness things, it wins. Doing the right things, that is, um, uh, uh, helping unwind a transaction that got sideways, uh, realizing there was a problem that somebody needed to adjust, holding off on a shipment for a while because somebody had a request. All these um, uh, sort of uh, additional services of uh, getting uh, the, uh, the wheels of transactions greased. So efficiency, of course, is important, but it isn't just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, you clicked and shot and you're done, but all the exceptions and all the, um, like, try getting Amazon on the phone, right, if somebody's delivered the wrong thing, right, that kind of thing in terms of effectiveness. There's no evidence they would say that digital is cheaper, just less profitable. We lowered the price faster than the cost. Um, it's okay for newer cars, but physical is good for old, and the older cars on the road are growing every year. 
the physical car must always be dealt with. You cannot beam up uh, the car, Scotty. And digital is about standardization. Physical is about exceptions. And as long as exceptions persist, um, then um, we need the physical auction. This, this sometimes comes up when people talk about um, smart contracts on the blockchain replacing lawyers because you can standardize all contracts. Lawyers exist when the standard contract didn't work. That's what they're doing is managing exceptions. There's no lawyer coming in there and saying, well, I see you ordered a book from Amazon, so let's take a look at this contract and see if this is okay. It's when things go wrong. Okay, so consigners, uh, and again, this, this camp would assert uh, that, that um, uh, the consigners like digital cost, if it is indeed lower in speed, but only physical can really move the volume. So th these are the two camps. And I ask people, well, what is your, your firm doing? And it's all over the map. It says, I'll guess 3 to 5% at my auction is truly online, including all hybrid, on and offline. We're 80-20 now, but 50-50 in 5 to 10 years. Digital makes sense in 1 to 2-year-old cars, but it's only 10 to 15% of the volume. Pure online, 5 to 10%, but growing. Um, here, maybe 25% simulcast, 5% true online. Counting simulcast, 60-40 uh, on off for an old one, 10-90. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's just on and on and on. So a real battle. Digital is not always disruptive. I'd like to make this point here. We all know, we all know that Airbnb is disrupting the hotel industry. Well, if it is, the green line is Airbnb's disclosed rate of listings online, 2011, 2017. The blue line is the hotel occupancy rate. So, um, and as a matter of fact, in 2017, hotel occupancy rates in the United States hit the highest level since they kept stats for the last three decades. So maybe they're complementary as opposed to directly head-to-head. -head. And as we've seen now, Airbnb has started announcing forays into building its own physical properties. Huh. Okay. Also, digital can take time. This is the line of the percentage of total retail sales in the United States that are done digitally online straight on up, and I agree, this is going on and on and on and will only gain more and more share. But does anybody know, when it all comes down and you add up all the dollars, what percentage of all retail transaction dollars in the United States are done online? Just under 9%. It's huge, it's grown very rapidly, it'll continue to grow very rapidly, but in 17 years it got to 9%. Now maybe it's about to kick upward to a much faster rate. This is something, this is what we've got to look at. But again, digital can take time, and sometimes it goes the other way. Here's an example from the UK. G3, um, established in 2009 as an online vehicle remarketing specialist. It has grown become a well-known independent brand in the digital arena uh, in 2009, and 2016 opened physical auctions because the consigners were demanding them. So it went from di pure digital to digital physical hybrid, or as we say in the South, hybrid. Okay, CRs, of course, uh, I, I've got to really accelerate here because I have no time left. Uh, so I was, the consensus is when they're close to perfect, online will be able to dominate. They are not there yet, but, but certainly moving in this direction. Has made the mistake of leaping to help fleets do this. Be careful what you wish for. Um, we still get paid, but not as much, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let me go into, as always, we'll find a balance. If we look at uh, some of the quotes, let's face it, many consigners see auctions as a last resort. A welcome last resort, but still the last resort. So I'm not sure, this is the most backhanded compliment I ever got. Um, sort of like, well, I went through my book and you were the only date available Friday night. Um, sure, but where else can a consigner go where they might get more than they expected? Uh, to be blunt, when the market is up, upstream works fine, and when it is down, they're back. Uh, rental, of course. Um, rental, you don't really have to project trends because there's only three firms that dominate the industry, so just watch what they do. And of course, um, uh, the move from program to risk cars made upstream remarketing more possible uh, for these firms. Um, the move has been significant. You know the various details and data of this. Um, the trend is not linear. There'll be ups and downs and regional versus national variations. So again, uh, watch for any aggressive moves. But some of the quotes are, as long as auctions improve efficiency and speed and continue to invest in IT to link with us, we'll continue to use them. A little ominous, but favorable. In a way, we'd love to avoid auctions, but we cannot. Again, another little backhand there. Uh, if interest rates rise, we may accelerate upstream remarketing. Uh, let's be honest, when our supply is less than demand, we go it alone. When supply is more than demand, the auction is my best friend. Okay. 
All right, so uh, off lease, of course, uh, has been, I'm gonna really fly by here. Franchise dealers upstreaming. Um, uh, hard to say what's going on here. Large chains can do it up, upstream. I talked to one of the major six chains who said we try to never wholesale ever if we can help it. Uh, but Penske says about 80% of our inventory is from auctions. Um, and then, of course, you can participate by making it possible for these guys to run their auctions because you're doing it for them, the heavy lifting. Uh, CarMax, of course, is the one that attracts all the attention. Uh, and uh, so keep an eye on them and whether other people try to expand further there. So um, used car dealers, uh, auction reliant, NIDA data. 2007, what percentage of them are sourced vehicles from auction? 75%, 2016, 95%. I apologize, I'm going, I am going to really fly at this point in time because I am now at negative two minutes, which I think is impossible, but um, time travel works. Person to person, let me just show you BCA in the UK. They buy, it's an auction firm, they buy 200,000 cars a year off the road, off individuals, and then auction them. Uh, could somebody do this in the United States? Probably somebody already is, and I just didn't pick it up, but an interesting direct move. One of the challenges here for upstream remarketing is as car quality improves, problems for 100 cars just keeps dropping and dropping, it is easier to transact online because the car has less things wrong with it. But the average age of the fleet keeps going up, so there's more condition issues. Not manufacturing defects, but condition issues which make it harder to go upline, online, so uh, upstream. So where is the balance? Range of views and the upstream growth. Uh, again, a range here, and we'll go with uh, probably continues to grow uh, but again, at a steady clip as opposed to a gallop. The app crew, you know, what started in retail in terms of apps for, you know, supposedly getting your car um, uh, transacted beyond Craigslist or Auto Trader, of course, has come to wholesale. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I've missed a few of them here. You know, they just proliferate and proliferate. And so the idea here is I think this is actually wholesaler version 2.0, uh, more digital and more upstream. Uh, focused on dealer-to-dealer -dealer market, attacking dealer-to-dealer -dealer uh, direct, traditional wholesalers and auctions, enabled by smartphone apps and advanced IT, operating on a 24-7 basis, of course, mostly focused on newer cars, widely varying business models. Some are just VIN lookup, others are buy-sell matching. Some take capital risk, some don't. Um, individually, no problem, collectively a concern, as one senior executive called it. Each individual one is not a big challenge, but collectively, we should be more worried. Lots of pros and cons here. Uh, pro, often well-funded, younger dealers are comfortable with them. No bricks and mortar, low basis of cost. Uh, con, there's still a middleman. A lot of them talk about, hey, cut out the middleman, work with us. Um, and uh, so far, relatively low volume. Neutral positions are, of course, auctions can do this. Trade rev, for example. Other people say auctions can't do this because they can't take ownership and compete with their customers. And then other people say auctions can serve these guys, but it's lower profit. Okay, how will it be remarketed? Somewhat more digital and upstream. What are the implications for auctions? Shifting economics. The baseline is you guys, yeah, it says here, wrap up, my time is up. So, um, Baseline is you guys have really strong economics in that highly variable cost structure uh, and offsetting revenue flown. So if in a recession, the volume goes down but the sell rate goes up. Uh, so, uh, but uh, my guess is probably dead neutral. Not seeing actually a huge stampede for the exits at this point in time. But on the left, it's Expedia. Do you know how much Expedia takes as a percentage of uh, the hotel room rate for its commission? 25% and has destroyed the travel agency industry. If you believe it's realtor.com, real, real estate agents have learned to adapt and work with digital and have survived. Okay, um, so we'll do one slide on the four horsemen of the apocalypse um, and then we're done. The four horsemen, electric vehicles. Confidence is high that their impact will be neutral on auctions. Uh, we forecast getting to 5% market share by 2025, but you guys can sell anything, and EVs will just be one more thing to sell. Uh, connected car, I'll just say, is neutral, and we'll skip that. 
positive on autonomous vehicles, uh, looking for significant growth in autonomous vehicle penetration. Uh, right now, 1% of the new fleet is at level two, so we have a long way to go, but it should grow fairly rapidly. The impact is probably positive. As Tom mentioned, autonomous vehicles will be driven hard, will wear out faster, and be back in the remarketing loop faster. BMW has said that any transportation network company that wants to put a BMW in the fleet must market it out at 35,000 miles because they do not want anybody to ever see a BMW older than that, for example. Um, and uh, also it will probably boost new car sales as the elderly and disabled get back on the road with cars that allow them to drive where they couldn't before. Pretty high. The big if is the mobility services, the Ubers and the Lyft, highly uncertain to the extent that, as Tom mentioned, could happen. We break the age-old bond between Americans being citizens and owning a vehicle and instead sharing vehicles because a, an autonomous robo-taxi is cheaper in cents per mile, then we see SAR plummet, new car sales plummet, and used car sales plummet with them. Uh, it is unclear, it's probably negative for us, uh, and our confidence, though, in this forecast is low. Um, if I live in downtown San Francisco, it is a no-brainer. Uh, my daughter lives in Boston. Someone sold the parking space at the condo next to hers for $200,000. If a parking space costs $200,000, you take Uber. I talked to a, te a Texas truck dealership, and I said, what do you think about sharing pickup trucks? And let us say I would be found floating face down in the Pecos River if I tried to share somebody's you know, crew cab dually. <laughs> you figure out where we end up in the middle. OK, so to wrap it all up, and this, we'll skip international entirely. We're Americans. We don't deal with other countries' uh, regulatory stuff. Um, uh, the, a few disruption type things here, uh, Walmart and Amazon, but we'll skip that. And so, this is it. The past shapes the future. Auctions have adapted in the past. I think they will continue to adapt. The long-term flow of used cars should be stable if unlikely to grow. The mix of customers will shift, and not necessarily favorably. Digital and upstream remarketing will grow, pressuring profit. The four horsemen are net neutral to positive for now. The overall outlook, while positive, is more volatile than before. Implications for action, continue to invest in IT to stay competitive, continue to broaden and deepen services to restore revenues, redouble cost control to maintain profits as margins are pressured, stay alert for accelerating trends or new entrants, hire Tom to come and talk. Uh, summing up, over the next five to 10 years, evolution but not revolution and renewal but not reinvention yet. Thank you to all of you for participating in the project and for your patience as I ran badly over uh, today. Appreciate it, thank you.